The supply squeeze is about to explode. And how to position now. Now learning how to invest in the markets and understand where prices will likely go is simple, but it's not always so easy. While many experts want to make understanding these prices very complex, the reality is it's always about two levers, supply and demand. More supply and less demand and the prices go down. More demand and less supply and the prices go up. It's easy, right? Except that prices don't always move according to supply and demand for many reasons. There are inefficiencies that cause delays, there are mismatches in perception versus reality, and this is what creates volatility. Prices going up and down, and for the experienced investor that understands these mismatches and has the patience for them to work out, it can lead to massive oversized profits. So, in this video, I'm going to break down the supply squeeze that's happening right now. Why this mismatch has gotten so far out of place. The actual data and the numbers so you can see and understand just how far this is out of whack. What the catalyst is to bring all this back to reality. And how we need to position if we want to take advantage of this mismatch in the markets for huge profits. So let's go. All right, welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss. I make these videos to change the way you think about money or because almost everything you've learned is wrong. And the way that you look at things sometimes is wrong as well. And that's why you hear things about, you know, contrarian investing like uh, buy what's hated, buy what's cheap, because it works against what we typically know. Everything we know is wrong. We have to work against that. So I'm going to break that down for you. I'm going to show you the mismatches, show you the catalyst and what I'm doing and what I think is a good option. Okay. So everything is changing. The entire world is changing. I talk about this all the time. The world we are going into is not the same as the one we are leaving behind. Um, and so we have to understand that we are going from what has been a, a unipolar world. So the world has been swinging towards centralization with the UN and the IMF and the World Economic Forum, et cetera, the dollar reserve currency. It's a, a, a unipolar world. And we're now going to a multipolar world. This is happening right before our very eyes. It's happening really, really fast. If you know what you're looking for, of course, I have a picture here. These two people uh, are at least going into a tripolar world, but I think it's going to go to a multipolar multipolar world. And what we can see is that this is ending the fiat regime as we know it. We're talking about fiat currencies. All right, let's take a look at a couple things here first. So um, this is uh, from Alistair McLeod. Um, he was talking about the end game in three sentences, the end game. What's the end game for the fiat regime? The fake fiat money. I know we've been talking about the end of the dollar for a long time. We're talking about the end of fiat. It's a big difference. From COVID, the first one, three things, from COVID being a one-off economic crisis that required enhanced deficit spending by governments, that was the first thing, the pandemic, the black swan event, it forced the governments to print trillions and trillions of dollars, right? The second thing, now we see a second one-off crisis, again, another black swan event, that now is centered on subsidizing energy and food. So in the United States and even way more in Europe, they have to subsidize now the energy, uh, the energy companies, the energy markets, and even the, the uh, you know, residential homeowners, et cetera, they're subsidizing all their bills now. So that's another one-off event. And now this will be followed by a further and increasing demand for inflationary funding. So they're going to have to keep printing more money. It's going to be causing more inflation. Attempts to prevent Western economies from contracting. So the economies are contracting, so they don't want to prevent that from happening. Remember, the bubble always has to be going up or else it's going to deflate. So attempts to prevent it from contracting, buyer strikes in bond markets along with collapsing bank credit will probably be the coup de grace for fiat currencies or the end. This is how it's playing out and it's happening in real time. Some people think we could see this play out before the end of this year. It's getting that dire. And we can see that the BRICS, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, the BRICS have been growing. More and more countries have been joining the BRICS. We have Iran join the BRICS. We have Argentina. And now over half of the people on the globe are part of the BRICS nations. And now they are developing a new global reserve currency per Putin. He says that they're doing that currently, currently working on setting up a new global reserve currency is being worked out. So there's no trust anymore. I've talked about this extensively. Trust is gone. No one trusts this fake fiat monetary system anymore because 
We saw in Canada, people got their bank accounts freeze, uh, frozen and seized. Then Russia, one of three global superpowers with nuclear weapons, got their bank accounts frozen and seized. And Putin said it himself. What nation in the world will hold their money in a system that could just be taken from them? Even China has been doing massive actions over the last six months to get ready for sanctions of their own, get ready in case their bank accounts gets frozen and seized. And so what nation has a chance if it happens to Russia, what other nations have a chance? None, obviously. So they're all scrambling to move to a new reserve currency or a new type of a financial network. We can see here just this week, China's President Xi, Xi Jinping went and met, now went and met with Putin in his first trip outside of China in two years. He hasn't left China in two years and why did he leave? He left to go meet with Putin. Why did he do that? Well, it must be pretty important if he just finally decided to leave his country in two years. And it says here, because of the summit, Xi Jinping meets Vladimir Putin, says, quote, China is willing to work with Russia on what? Core interests. What are those core interests? Well, one is not having a money system that the U.S. can freeze at will. That's one. Two, China needs energy. China needs to import over 85% of its energy. Who exports energy? Oh yeah, Russia. You're starting to get the hang of it. So you can see this is all happening really, really quickly. Now, they're working on this new reserve currency and even more specifically what they wanna do is they understand that we are at the end of the fiat regime. President uh, Putin, Vladimir Putin said here, quote, the economy of imaginary wealth, fake credit, fake fiat currency, the economy of imaginary wealth is being inevitably replaced. It's being replaced. Replaced with what? Replaced by the economy of real and hard assets. What are hard assets? Uh, real things like gold, metals, commodities, food, energy, real things. So he says it himself, the economy of imaginary wealth is being replaced by real, inevitably, inevitably, because it's always gonna end, inevitably being replaced by real hard things. And what we see here, I've talked about this before, I put it up on my Twitter a little while ago, Russia and the BRICS nations can't move to a gold standard that is controlled and manipulated by the LBMA. What's the LBMA? The London Bullion Market Association. They set the price of gold every day. A couple guys get on the phone every morning. Hey, what should the price of gold be this morning? Okay, that sounds good. And they set the price of gold. It's not done in a free market. So how can the BRICS nations move to a gold standard when the price of gold is controlled by London? doesn't make any sense. So they propose a new standard, a new system to compete with the LBMA. What happens when the LBMA loses control of price suppression? So they're suppressing the price down, pushing the price of gold down. What happens when there's a competitor and they can no longer do that? Well, you see this little rocket ship right there? That gives you an idea of what could happen when that happens. They will break the gold markets and we could see the price of gold explode. All right, so that's the catalyst. This is happening, it's happening. Now, will Xi and Putin finally get along and will they create this? You know, maybe not, maybe they'll have some disagreement. It could not happen, but he just went to go meet with them first trip in two years, it's happening. Uh, they are setting these competitors up. Will it, will it work, will they break it? I mean, I don't know, but they're doing it and it probably has a good chance of succeeding. So. What we're already seeing is that other people see the same things. Other people are seeing the same things and they're acting on it. So we're seeing gold vaults being depleted, runs on the vaults, runs on the banks. What's a run on the bank? A run on the bank once everyone goes to get their money because they realize there's not enough money in the bank to go around. The same thing is happening with gold vaults. They realize there's not enough gold to go around and so they're going to get it out. Now, we don't know because the markets are so manipulated, but somewhere in the range of 300 paper, fake paper ounces of gold for every one real physical ounce. That means <laughs> only one out of 300 people are gonna actually go get the gold. The other 299 people, they're gonna end up with fake worthless piece of paper that actually does nothing. And so what we're seeing is that the sovereigns want metals, sovereign, sovereign nation, sovereign wealth funds, hundreds of billions of dollars. They realize their money's at risk. I don't want my money at risk from being seized because I might end up on the naughty list. So I should move some into gold. Sovereigns want metals, hundreds of millions of dollars. And um, investors are also trying to do that. And what we're seeing is massive demands on the COMEX. What's the COMEX? So the COMEX is a global derivatives market that allows for trading 
of futures contracts. So the COMEX is basically the gold bank and it allows traders to bet, bet you know, on and off of gold. The majority of gold and silver is traded in paper. So no one's really buying gold and moving gold around the country. They're just pay trading on paper. As I said, about 300 paper ounces to every one physical ounce. Sometimes though, sometimes investors actually stand for delivery, meaning they want to take delivery, but they say, but this is more expensive. Obviously you got to ship the gold somewhere. It could be very expensive to do that. In order to take delivery, the investor must post 100% by first position date. That's what it's called. So we can see when that money gets posted on what's called the first position date, and we can see how much gold is up for delivery. It says here, the COMEX guarantees these deliveries each month. So the COMEX, while people are just trading in, in paper, if somebody wants it for delivery, the COMEX has to guarantee to deliver it but they know they don't have enough gold to go around. What happens if more people request to take deliveries than they have available? Interesting question. We're going to dig into that. All right. Tracking the delivery data can provide insight into the physical demand. So looking at when people want it to be delivered, we can start to see what the actual demand is for the physical, not just for the people trading the paper. When an investor takes delivery, it is presumed, They've assumed, they've presumed, they are doing it with a purpose. Why would someone take it uh, for delivery? Well, there must be a good reason. Why must there be a good reason? Because it's very expensive. It's very difficult to take delivery. So they must have a good reason if they want to do that. While there could be multiple reasons for taking delivery, a quote unquote bank run could ultimately manifest. Why? Because out of the 300 people waiting for their gold, one of them's going to get it and you don't want to be the last one to go get your gold and find out it's not there. Now we can see there's lots of articles. You can spend a little bit of time on the search engine and find this. Comics inventories are plummeting. I'm going to show you the data here in a second. Is a vault run underway? Doesn't take very long for a few people to lose confidence and people want to go take delivery and it happens really, really fast. So is this already happening? We're going to take a look at some charts. I got a bunch of them ready for you, of course. So here's what we have is the gold daily cumulative change in stock. So this is when more gold is being added. It's about even the amount of outflows equal the amount of inflows here. The amount of outflows equal the amount of inflows, but all of these outflows, but where's the inflows? All of these outflows, where's the inflows? All of these outflows, all of these, <laughs> are you getting the point? Where's the, where's the new supply coming in? How much more can they continue to drain out of the COMEX vaults before there's an absolute run and they run dry? Now, what happens if the COMEX can't actually make a delivery? What happens if the world finds out that COMEX doesn't have the gold to deliver? Well, supply and demand, I think you already know is what happens. All right, now that's gold. What about silver? I know a lot of you, lot of you guys love silver. Uh, here's a picture of a Wall Street bets. Now it's Wall Street silver. Um, of course, they're talking about shorting this or short squeezing the silver supply a lot. So silver is in very short supply. Not only is it in short supply because of the traders and the speculators and the people that actually want it, it's also in short supply because of the industrial demand. So now the whole world's trying to go green. We're trying to build out EV everywhere. We're trying to build out charging stations, We're trying to build out solar panels. And what do we need for all that? We need silver. And we don't produce enough silver for the demand plus the traders and speculators. Take a look at that. So the inventories in silver are absolutely plummeting, just like gold or actually even worse. So here's the same thing in silver, about an even inflow and outflow here, way more outflow than inflow here, more outflow, more outflow, more outflow. Where is the inflow? Where is the silver? It's not there. You can see that it's not there. What we can see is that while it's not there, we haven't even got to the busy part of the year yet. So this is a month over month silver delivery, historical deliveries. And what we can see is August is just traditionally a very low month. But once we start getting into uh, basically Q4, look what happens. So we are about to get into the very busy part of the season, but they haven't been restocking the silver supplies. That could be a pretty big problem. What we can see here is that silver registered is down by 11% in the last month alone. The amount of silver registered there is down. The last week has been very quiet. 
over the last year registered has lost over 50 million ounces or 48 percent so they've lost almost half the amount of silver they've had just over the last year a repeat of the last year would see comics registered fully exhausted <laughs> empty are you understanding what is going on now why would they try to pretend that there's money there? Well, of course, just like any bank, they want to make money off of pretending they have the assets. And of course, the existing regime, the fiat regime, and the Federal Reserve and the ECB and the COMEX and the LBMA, they want to keep this charade going. They want to continue to manipulate the market to keep the prices down because if enough people see the prices going up, what are they going to do? They're going to dump all their fiat currency and they're going to go buy the gold and silver. So they try to keep the price of gold and silver down so you keep your dollars. Nobody wants to buy uh, gold or silver right now, right? Well, maybe you do. That's why you're watching this video. Let's keep digging in and see how bad this is. That's the uh, COMEX. Now let's look at the LBMA. So the London silver inventories continue to plummet as metal exits the LBMA vaults. And this is uh, from uh, September 11th. Okay, this is right now. An unprecedented situation is emerging in London. Unprecedented. We haven't seen this before. It's hemorrhaging, relentless hemorrhaging, it says, of one of the world's largest stockpiles of silver. Relentless hemorrhaging. Sounds pretty dire. Of the largest stockpile of silver. It's been consistently falling each and every month and has now reached an all-time low. Bullion Banks by JP Morgan, HSBC, ICBC, Standard Bank, as well as the London vaults of three security operators, Brinks, Malka Emmett, and Loomis, have been depleted. Just for visuals, you can take a look at this and you can see this is back till 2017. So the inventories were going up. They've maintained basically flat through here. And now look how fast they are being drained. I mean, that is what, yeah, severe hemorrhaging. That's what, that's the word they use. And I would agree we had that. Now, what's interesting is as these are being drained and the price of silver is very low, What's interesting is that there's massive shorts being put into the market. That's interesting. Why would there be shorts? It makes sense that the, that short interest would be high when silver is high. So if the price of silver was at like an all time high right now, then people would be putting shorts because it's at an all time high. It's got to come down. Yeah, I'm going to bet that it comes back down. But when silver is at a very low price, why would people be shorting it? You don't short the bottom. You buy the bottom, you short the top. What's going on here? But now that silver is so low, why would people do that? The only explanation is authorized participants are authorized participants. That means the insiders, not me and you. Authorized, I'm not authorized, neither are you. Authorized participants are shorting silver to deliver shares against silver bullion. So they're shorting it in the paper markets to work against the physical markets. How desperate the market is for bullion. I think we are close to a nickel moment. If you remember the nickel moment, uh, they found out they were short, they couldn't deliver the nickel, and the price of nickel exploded. And in order to save the markets, the LME had to go back and roll that back, and the traders who got it right lost billions of dollars. All right, that's what they're talking about, a nickel moment, we're very close to that. Why are people short in the bottom? Because of the manipulation, that's how desperate they are. Now we can see one of the biggest silver uh, speculators or investment companies in the world, we're talking about Sprott. We can see here that they, this is 9.7, so just a few days ago here, and they added 500,000 ounces of gold just there on 9.7. Here we are again with Sprott, and this time is 9.12, and they've added, uh, what do we got here, another million here on 9.12, and then again, they just want to keep adding, and here we have, this is 9.13, and they've added another, what do we got, another 600,000 ounces again. Sprott, they're buying millions and millions and millions of dollars of silver at a time when the price of silver is very low and the inventories are completely running out. Now, to put some numbers behind this, the LBMA, London Bullion Market Association, is down 254 million ounces in just nine months. Let's put this into some perspective. They are holding 28,000 tons of silver, 28,000. The world produces only 26,000 tons per year. 
That means, and Sprott's added a million, millions of ounces. So if we're only producing 26,000 tons, we're holding 28. So basically we have about one year supply of silver. Now with gold, gold never disappears. All the gold that's ever been mined is still in existence. Silver disappears because it's used in, or in, uh, in manufacturing, in production. So we are very low on silver. All right, so now that we've set that up, how do you position yourself? Well, there's a couple ways. There's three that you can, I can think of just big ones. So one, physical, if you can get it. Getting the physical is very difficult right now. And if you're, if you're gonna get it, you're probably gonna pay huge premiums. So be careful, don't pay too high premiums. Physical, you can get junk silver. Junk silver is like old pre-1965 dimes, quarters, nickels. You can get bags of them. You can get bars, just uh, standard silver, bars, things like that, rounds. Or you can get coins, all right? So that's physical. You can get bars, depending on how much you're trying to buy. The next way is you can do the ETFs and you can do options. And so that's the way if you want to kind of get some leverage, um, if you want to do options, you can get leverage on that silver. Um, the problem with the ETFs is like I said, they've sold hundreds of paper ounces for every one physical ounce. So at the end of the day, you're probably going to be held left with nothing. And if the silver market breaks, meaning the COMEX, the LBMA can't make delivery at some point, which looks like it's about to happen. If that were to happen, your ETFs, they're going to go to zero. So that's probably not a good situation to be in. And then the third way is to actually get the producers, the ones who are bringing the silver out of the ground. This might be one of the best ways if you want to get leverage, if you want massive exponential returns with very limited downside. The thing that I like about silver miners is you cap your downside, but you have unlimited upside with leverage without needing any margin. Let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. All right, so I'm gonna show you the best way to get leverage with massive upside and basically limited downside. And I'm gonna use this company, Silver Mountain Resources, as an example. Now, just a disclaimer to you, this is a promotional video. I'm not telling you to go buy this. I'm using it for instructional purposes. Um, you, you can use this to go find other ones that you like, or you can take a look at this one as well. But disclaimer, it's a promotional video. I'm not telling you to buy it, but this is what we wanna use for our education. So, how do we do it? How do we get this leverage play? Well, we wanna find a company that has it in the ground. Why? Well, if silver goes up by a couple bucks an ounce, that's cool, I made a couple bucks. But what if the company has 10 million ounces in the ground and then it goes up by a couple of bucks. That's a big difference. That's what we're talking about. So Silver Mountain is a pure silver play. Now a lot of, a lot of mines, gold silver mines, get multiple types of uh, minerals and metals out of the ground at the same time. And typically silver is just one of the um, byproducts that come out of the ground. This is a pure silver play, which is better for two reasons if you like silver. One, the mine will last longer. So they're gonna need less capex, less investment to get more silver out of the ground. Two, they're going to get more silver out of the ground because like I said, usually it's just a byproduct. It's also in the most prolific area in the world for getting silver out of the ground. So if you wanna get, uh, if you wanna get good silver, you should probably go to where the best silver is and you can see where this is this little tiny sliver of South America right there where this is the most prolific area. And what I like about this company too is that they are permit ready. This is a very key piece because what happens is it could take two to five years to get all the permits into place to start building. And this gold market's gonna already be bust wide open before that happens. And so you wanna get something that's ready to go right now. You also want something that has a proven track record. So getting into these like silver exploration companies can be very risky. If they hit it big, it's great, but they're also, <laughs> A lot of times not going to hit a big. And so you want to work with ones that already have a proven track record. And so Silver Mountain has that. If you're looking at any silver plays, make sure they meet all that criteria. All right, on top of that, you know that I always like to follow success. Success leaves clues. I also like to beat success. If I can do better than the most successful people, I feel like I've done pretty good. Now, I'm not the most competitive guy in the world, but I wanna do that. So, what do I mean by that? So, in the pre-IPO round, when this company, when Silver Mountain went, uh, was going public, before they did, they had a pre-IPO round. That's just for the insiders. That's, that's not for you and me, that's for the really, really, really connected people. They went public, or the, the pre-IPO round went at 33 cents Canadian. That's how much it went for. And they had some of the most prolific silver investors in the world, including Eric Sprott, we talked about Sprott's fund earlier from Jose Vizquera. He's the grandson of one of the most successful silver miners in the world. So they got in at 33 cents Canadian. 
But that's because they're like billionaires and they're the most respected people in the silver world. You and I didn't get that. Then they did an IPO round and you and I, we weren't invited into that either. The IPO round went for 50 cents Canadian. All right. They have, again, Sprott took a few more million dollars there. Franklin Templeton is one of the largest financial asset managers. They're in the top 500, Fortune 500. They have, I think, a trillion and a half dollars assets under management. Franklin Templeman, Templeton, and then Merck, which is a giant commodities company, they all got in with millions of dollars each at 50 cents. So the first round at 33, second round at 50 cents. Today's price is 17 cents. Why? Well, there's been a big mismatch in the market. I'm going to explain to you why, but we've kind of uh, hit this like uh, peak where gold and silver were going up, up, up until November. Right. And then as the market started to crater, it's come back down. And so they were able to do these IPOs here at the top. And we had this opportunity to get it down low at the bottom right now. Good opportunity for us. Now, what we want to do as investors is we want to buy when things are cheap and we want to sell them when they're expensive. Buy low, sell high. So easy, right? If only we knew how to do that. Easier said than done. Well, what we do is we want to buy things when they're cheap. So we want to be able to benefit from this down cycle. It just seemed to work out that they did the pre-IPO and the IPO at the peak of the market, and now it's dropped down. Now, obviously those investors, Franklin Templeton, Sprott, Merck, et cetera, they thought it was a great deal at 33 cents. They thought it was a great deal at 50 cents. So if it was a great deal at 50 cents, it's a way better deal at 17 cents. Now let's break down some math for you. Okay. So you take the price of the stock times the total amount of stock gives you the market cap or the valuation of the company right now. As of today, the market cap of this company is at 40 million. All right. 40 million. That's the market cap. Now the company has 17 million cash on hand in the bank cash. On top of it, they have $28 million of assets. So if you add that up, you got 17 million in cash, 28 million in assets, gives you 45 million, all right? So their assets are more than what the companies value them. So if you were to break the company down, take the cash and sell the assets, you would end up with more than the market cap. Typically a good thing. You wanna buy it for, le we're, we're getting the assets for less than we can buy them for. Now on top of this, Part of the assets is the mine they have, which has 80 million ounces in the ground. So remember, if it goes up by two or three bucks, that's cool if you had a couple ounces, but if you have 80 million ounces and it goes up by five or 10 bucks, that's a big deal. Now, typically when you value a silver mining company, silver in the ground, not brought out yet, is worth about $2 per ounce, okay? So 80 million ounces at the market rate of $2 in the ground, um, plus the $17 million in cash that they have works out to be $177 million of value. And we get it all for a market cap of 40 million. So we're end up paying like uh, 20 cents an ounce instead of two bucks an ounce. We're getting it for 20 cents an ounce, something like that. All right. Now, <clears throat> The one thing that you have to keep in mind, remember as an investor is buy low, sell high. So pricing is more important is greater than timing. What does that mean? We can't time the bottom and we can't time the top. We don't know until we look backwards. What we do is we try to buy things when they're hated and cheap and we sell when people are greedy and expensive. That's what we do. So what we're looking for is that we want to buy hated and we want to sell cheap. The way that we get hated and cheap is we're looking for something called a mismatch multiplier. This is what I call it, a mismatch. And I like the mismatch multiplier. So what do I mean? I'm talking about the difference of perception and reality. This is the mismatch. What's the difference of the perception and reality? Well, the difference is that uh, supposedly gold and silver are hated. So the perception is that nobody wants it. The perception is the price continues to drift lower and lower. Gold's going lower, silver's going lower. The perception is it's dead. Nobody wants it. That's the perception. The reality though is no, 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 that's not, that's not true at all. As a matter of fact, they're, it's getting bought up as fast as it can. The COMEX and the LBMA, they're getting completely drained. China and Russia are trying to corner the market. If they can move to a gold backed system, or metals back system and other nations try to go get some metals and there's none available. 
they get left in the cold. So it makes sense that all of this is moving off of the market, and once they announce what they're gonna do, there's not gonna be any available. All right, so the perception is it's dead. Nobody wants it. The price keeps shifting lower. The reality is it's all getting taken off the market and we could have a short squeeze happening at any time. We know the supply is very low. We know the demand is very high, not in the retail, but in the institutional and the sovereign side. Eventually, the market catches up. That's the difference of perception and reality. You have to be able to see the difference. This is what causes volatility. If we look at like, um, if we look at an asset going up like this, but it's volatile, right? So the difference is perception gets over, overstated and then it drops back down and then perceptions gets too low. The reality is this line here. And so we're looking for these peaks and valleys to have our opportunities and that's what we have right here. So hopefully that makes sense to you. It's a good opportunity if you think it's gonna break, but do you? Do you think that the COMEX and LBMA shortages could cause a run on the bank? And if so, do you think it could push the price of silver and gold up? Now, some people say that if gold gets put back into some sort of a reserve currency status to back a reserve currency status, you take all the currency in the world, all the fiat currency, divided by all the gold in the world, and you end up at 40 or $50,000 per ounce. Now, I'm not saying go up that high, but it could. It's a possibility, but to see it double, triple, quadruple from here is a pretty good probability. I think it could happen over the next couple of years and owning a silver miner is one of the best ways to get leveraged play on that. But let me know what you think in the, in the comments down below. Of course, there's always gonna be a thumbs up on this video if you like it. If you don't, you can give me a thumbs down, that's okay, but at least tell me, tell me why. Leave me a comment, tell me why. Hit that subscribe button while you're at it and that's what I got for you today, all right? To your success, I'm out.